My name is Rick, and I brought something. This is the Altair 8800. It's actually the first home computer, and I built it myself. Well, not the original one, because that was in 1975, but this is a replica. So it's a tribute to the first home computer. And you had to assemble this thing yourself. It was very time-consuming to program, because you had to flip these switches and enter commands in binary code. So it was very time-consuming, very slow, and also very, 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 very complicated to do. But it was the first home computer. And this was affordable. You could buy this for uh, 400 or 500 dollars. And before that, computers looked like this. Big machines, only affordable by big companies and research institutes. So imagine, in 1975, nobody had a computer in their home. And now we all have a computer a smartphone in our pocket. And why did I bring this? You thought I was going to tell something about 3D printing, right? Well, I think there are a lot of similarities between the history of home computing and the current rise of 3D printing. So in 1975, there were two young guys who read in the popular electronics magazine the article about the, the Altair. And they saw the potential of that device. They understood that this could be something for in people's homes, but not the way the machine worked now. People didn't want to flip switches to program their computer. So they thought, we need to do something about that. And they wrote BASIC, a simple programming language for people to control their first computer. And that was a big success, like we all know. And as the time passed, computers started to look more like this, like the Commodore 64 and the MSX and the PC. And <coughs> I remember when I was eight or 10 years old, we had a computer at school already. And we were learning geography by flying with a helicopter over Europe. And even though most teachers and parents didn't know how a computer worked or what to do with it, we as kids, well, we got in, in act, we got in touch with these machines, these new machines, and I think it really shaped my future. Because when I was not at school, I was at home, working on my hut, and um, somehow the, it doesn't go to the next slide, so maybe the technicians can help me to move to the next slide. Because this is a nice image, of course. But yeah, so this is me there, in the top, sitting in my two-floor hut, and I was starting to do discoveries there. I was inventing stuff. I opened up electronic toys and uh, old radios and VCRs, video recorders. And I also found some early computers on local flea markets. And those machines were full with hidden magic. What did all those components do? How did a transistor work or a chip? It fascinated me, and it inspired me to, to come up with my own inventions. So I hacked my bicycle by adding alarm to it and uh, blinking lights and all kinds of weird stuff. And I showed my creations at school, and my classmates called me a nutty professor, which always has felt as a compliment. Um, and I think this one was my second invention. It was a uh, vending machine, a robot, uh, which could serve drinks and candy bars to the people. So they would throw in a coin, and then the machine magically knew what, to, what kind of drink to serve to the people. Or, and I was sitting in there, of course, help, helping, <laughs> helping the machine, because it, there was a lot of technology already in there, but I was helping. So, but while growing up, computers became more and more common, and I found myself studying things with computers, uh, and I moved to the city and started traveling the world, and when in between studies, I 
realized I wanted to simplify complicated stuff. I wanted to explain complex processes to people in an understandable and, and playful way. And that was the, the moment when I came up with the idea for a four-dimensional globe, a device which had a physical sphere, just like a traditional globe, but with an extra dimension. And with this one, you could time travel. You could go back in time by turning this ring and see continents drift, or water levels rise. And so my dream as a kid to become an inventor actually came true, because this device is now used in many science centers and museums worldwide. I think it's uh, in 25 different places or so. And I never realized that running a company and producing and building those globes also involved learning some uh, management and business skills. But luckily, I've, I've got a great business partner who's taking care of that, and I can still focus on the creative processes and the technology. So while creating a new prototype for, for this globe, um, I was, together with some friends, thinking about sharing our workshop with random strangers. Um, not to make money, but to exchange knowledge and ideas. So we started a fab lab in Amersfoort. And a fab lab was well, this, uh, this porto cabin we rented. And it's uh, a place where people can, can go to and, and use the machines there are. Uh, those, those machines are typically laser cutters or CNC mills uh, and also 3D printers. And it's, the idea in a fab lab is that you can use all the machines there for free and in, in return you share your knowledge. So what you learn and what you make, you open source everything and you share your design and your ideas. And it's a great way of growing a network of knowledge about digital fabrication. And this was in 2010. And 3D printers were already considered to be an essential tool in a fab lab. And normally those machines were ugly and big and very expensive and only used by big companies for prototyping. But we had this fab lab with those cheap machines. We, we, we had a Chinese laser cutter we bought on, uh, on the internet for 3,000 uh, euros. And buying a super expensive 3D printer did not make sense for us. But we heard a story that in a local fab lab nearby, in Utrecht, some guys had created a prototype of their own 3D printer. And they were giving a workshop, a multi-day workshop. So, of course, I signed up. And in a few weeks, a few weeks later, I had my own 3D printer. And it looked like this. And you had to assemble this yourself. And just like in the 70s, when you would assemble your first home computer. But it was a 3D printer. So consumer 3D printing had started. And so now I could program the physical world. But it was difficult to create your own designs for this. It was easy to download bunnies from the web and print those, but that got boring after a while. So I needed to learn a complicated 3D program, a CAD program, to uh, make designs for my 3D printer. But um, I, yeah, I thought, what if I would write my own program and make something that I can use, but also other people? And that was how Doodle 3D was born. And Doodle 3D had this very childish looking interface where you could only draw a line drawing and you could apply some effects to it, make the object higher, turn it around, twist it, uh, shape the, uh, the outside shape. And then you would just press print. So let's, let's do it. I will draw this heart here on the iPad and I will press print. And now the image is sent to the 3D printer over here. And it's already warm. You can see the, the temperature is going up from 218 to 220 degrees. And there is, I will show you a little bit about the machine. There is a little nozzle here, which is a, a very small hole. And that's the part which is really hot. And here on the back, 
there's a spool of plastic, and this plastic goes through this tube, and it leaks out in a very thin line. And it should be printing my heart now, well, the heart I drew, and it does that by, well, putting layers on top of this. So layer by layer, it will build up the object. And by using Doodle 3D, you had this very intuitive way of controlling a 3D printer, because everything you would draw here, the movement I make with my finger, is actually also the movement the printer makes. So for many people, this was the people, for example, in our fab lab who visited our lab, it was a really easy way for them to use and understand a 3D printer. So I will go to the next slide. You can see kids using, using the software and creating beautiful things with it. So, but there was one little problem. I wrote this software in a couple of hours, and it worked only on my computer. So I had to go to all those places and give workshops with my own computer. But that was not really scalable, of course. So at some point, I, had, I needed to present at the 3D printing conference somewhere, and I, I had this travel router laying around, and that was this, this little thing here. A very, very small router you normally use to create a Wi-Fi access point in your, uh, in your house. And I thought, what if I would turn this into a 3D printing server, which would connect a tablet to a 3D printer, which was not really common. You cannot directly connect those two devices with each other. But this Wi-Fi box, which became the Wi-Fi box, it was just this travel router. I put my business card on there, and I cut it away the edges. And then I had this product, and I showed it at the printing conference. And people loved it, and they thought that they started pre-ordering the thing. And it was not even a product yet. So um, when my colleague heard that, he thought, OK, if people are really happy about this, we, we should take this serious. And the, that was the moment we, uh, we started a Kickstarter to uh, find out if, if people uh, yeah, believed in the project. And they did, because 750 people signed up. And it took us six months to produce and to develop all the software, and then we could ship it to them. And while shipping, we also sold these boxes through uh, 3D printer manufacturers, and, and we already started working on our next app. So let's see. It printed this hard. Yeah, it's finished. <laughs> so we started, already started working on our next app, which had a similar idea. But it was, it was more advanced. With the first version of Doodle, you could only draw these line drawings. But of course, you, you also wanted to create more complicated stuff. And the biggest change between this new app and the previous one was that you could now apply different transformations on different parts of your drawing. So for example, if you take this juicer, it's built up of a star and a circle. And by giving these separate shapes a different transformation, you pull up the star and twist it around, sculpt it a bit, and the same for the circle. You can create almost anything. And this shows that 3D design doesn't have to be complicated. I think this, we did another Kickstarter for this one as well. And again, many people signed up. 1,680 people uh, believed in the project. So we could finish it by scaling up the team. And it took us almost a year to, to bring it at a point where we could really release this, uh, the, the version one of, of Doodle 3D Transform. But that, that happened uh, just six weeks ago. And since that time, around 1,500 people signed up, because there's now also a free version of the app. And over 90,000 doodles have been made already, of which 10,000 were cool enough to save. And all, around 7,000 prints have been made with the software already. So it's great that people are starting to use it. Um, and they do at school, at home, and in libraries. But I think we're not finished here, because not that 
it's we we and this is the moment where I grab my my notes because this is my last slide and I think when we look back at the Altair now this is 1975 if you look at this 3d printer I would compare it with a home computer from the 80s so so not with the Altair but with the Commodore 64 if you imagine that the Commodore 64 has evolved into an iPhone in less than 20 years, imagine how a 3D printer could look like in 20 years from now. So I am so very grateful to the people who brought in that computer in my school when I was a kid. I think I should take it as my personal duty to bring 3D printers into schools. And I will take care of the software by by developing, further developing Doodle 3D. But if there's anyone here in the audience or at home, um, if you could work on this together with me and let the kids of our next generation um, have access to 3D printers and 3D design, I think <coughs> this technology might have a similar impact as computers had on us when we were young, and let's see if we, uh, if we can do this together. Thank you. <laughs>